a minute. It's working on it. Okay. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our second edition of the Labor Forum, this time focusing on healing the nation, healthcare workers on the, on the front line, and what we argue is easily one of the most critical uh, topics that we need to be discussing and also spreading and educating each other on as we grow deeper into a crisis that we still do not have a solution on. But we're joined today by both scholars, organizers, activists, and different people who have been putting in their own type of of um of solutions and organizing each other so that we can survive and we can also strengthen each other after this issue. Um, my name is Gus Wood. I am a postdoctoral research associate with the Labor Education Program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I'm also one of I'm also involved in have a have a extensive history in labor organizing, and I focus on looking at African American labor struggles within urban spaces, uh, particularly post, uh, excuse me, um, late 20th and early 21st century. And so I'm excited to be here and I, and I get to introduce these wonderful organizers and scholars. So I wanna go ahead and get right to it and also bring in uh, my, my co-host, Stephanie Portado, my awesome colleague. But let's do the panelists first though. And so the first panelist we're, we're lucky to be joined by today is Dr. Rebecca Collins Given. I hope I pronounced it you right. Did. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca Collins Given is an Associate Professor of Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. She is the co-editor of Strike for the Common Good, Fighting for the Future of Public Education from the University of Michigan Press this year. Uh, and she's the author of The Challenge to Change, Reforming Healthcare on the Frontline in the United States and the United Kingdom from 2016, as well as numerous other articles on work in healthcare and education. And so her, her background and, and extensive deep research into labor studies is well documented. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you. Also, we are joined by Doris Carroll, who is a nurse of 37 years, still working full-time, specializing in HIV and primary care. She serves as president of the Illinois Nurses Association and vice president of the Illinois AFL-CIO. She is a founder of the Nurses Take DC movement, a nationwide grassroots movement to pass federal legislation for safe patient limits, HR 2581. She has worked with her union and other nursing organizations to support staffing ratios by supporting the passage in Illinois of legislation HB 2604, which unfortunately hasn't passed, thereby nurse staffing is now in crisis in Illinois as they battle COVID-19 pandemic issues. The, she continues to actively work in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic at her hospital in Illinois and across the country with her activism and leadership. So thank you, Doris, for joining us. Thank you so much, Gus. Appreciate and so overwhelmed to be here. Thank you. Awesome. And finally, we get to Alice Johnson, who is among the most influential healthcare labor professionals in the state of Illinois. As the current executive director of the Illinois Nurses Association, Alice has directed the operations and activities of the INA union and its staff since 2012. In that time, she, she spearheaded efforts to organize advanced practice nurses at retail health clinics and defeated Governor Rauner's effort to lay off more than 124 correctional center nurses in 2017. Under her tenure, INA has successfully advocated for, in, for important legislation protecting the safety of nurses against violence and defeated short-sighted efforts to dilute the scope of nursing practice. Prior to 2012, as a director of the INA's collective bargaining program, she directed and supervised INA's labor negotiations and representation. Prior to this, she was a staff attorney at the INA from 2006 to 2010, where she negotiated collective bargaining agreements and represented the INA in labor arbitrations and before the labor board. 
She has a law degree from Northern Illinois University and is a proud Saluki, graduating from SIU with a degree in journalism. So thank you, Alice, for joining us as well. Thank you. Happy to be here. And so we are, it's been established that we have some of the greatest scholars and activists here with us today. So this is going to be an absolutely wonderful discussion and an important one because the pandemic has placed healthcare workers at an epicenter of dealing with the damaging effects of COVID-19. Healthcare labor organizations, particularly nurses unions, have been the leading groups in calling for worker protections and other things to safeguard not only themselves, but the patients they care for. Their struggles and insights will be at the forefront of this discussion about the medical industry, labor relations, and pretty much everything that happens within the political economy moving forward. And so we have to centralize the, 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 the space that nurses have and the, and the nurses organizations, and we have to listen and implement their interests so that we can build a better future for each, for each other. And so I'll stop there and turn it over to my awesome colleague, Stephanie Fertile, to introduce herself and our wonderful um, scholar, uh, Robert Bruno. Thank Gus, thank you so much. So I'm also with the Labor Education Program at the University of Illinois, where I'm a lecturer, and along with uh, Dr. Wood, I'm a co-host of, of this program, where we try to bring pressing issues that have to do with labor and working people in the current moment uh, once a month uh, to this online forum. Um, part of the impetus of this is when, you know, when COVID hit, we didn't want to stop some of the critical conversations that we were having. And we thought that not only was it an opportunity to continue those conversations, but to bring in scholars. I mean, everybody's on Zoom, right? <laughs> Dave. So to bring in scholars and practitioners uh, just from across Illinois and from across the country that maybe we couldn't get together if we were doing this in person and, and try to turn sort of a moment of, a strange moment into a moment of opportunity to foster a conversation. Uh, so before we start with our panelists, we wanted to take a minute um, to hear from Dr. Bruno. Uh, Dr. Bruno is the director, Bob Bruno, of the uh, Labor Studies Program here at the University of Illinois. He is also the director of the Project for Middle Class Renewal, um, which is frankly uh, one of the leading sort of think, uh, I hate the word think tank, but le leading research and policy um, university-based uh, um, organizations around issues that matter to working people. And PMCR was uh, sort of Bob's brainchild and he does a lot of the research. And as you can imagine right now, quite a bit of that research has had to do with this issue of healthcare and nursing and frontline practitioners. So we wanted to give Bob just a brief moment to sort of connect uh, what the Project for Middle Class Renewal is doing on these issues before we get into a discussion um, with with our panelists. So, uh, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. I, I may be competing with uh, with the dog here. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I can uh, I can I can prevail. Um, what I do want to just say is that um, I've known these three folks for who are on our panel for many years. Uh, uh, Rebecca's scholarship uh, is something that's always impressed me. She's been a terrific colleague uh, in the years we've both been in the field. Um, and she's a leading voice uh, talking about healthcare professionals and the healthcare uh, industry. Uh, and both Doris and Alice uh, have been on the front line uh, in, in defending and working on behalf of healthcare workers, uh, nurses, of course, primarily. Uh, and as Stephanie notes, uh, we have done at the University of Illinois through the Project for Middle Class Reno, we've done a number of policy reports and papers dealing with working conditions for nurses. And we've been grateful that the INA has been responsive in helping us to gather research. Uh, Gus noted that the, uh, the nurse-patient ratio bill uh, that was proposed in Illinois has not yet uh, passed. Uh, but we did contribute what we thought was a really smart policy paper in analyzing uh, what would the likely positive impacts be if such ratios uh, uh, were, uh, were approved. So uh, here we are in the middle of a pandemic and our frontline healthcare workers are not only essential to healing the nation, keeping us healthy, but it's hard to imagine having a, um, 
having a caring, thoughtful, loving, moral nation that doesn't place high priority on the people who are taking care of us in the middle of a pandemic. So I think an awful lot is at risk, which makes this conversation really important. Uh, and I'm now going to surrender to the dogs, uh, go, on, uh, go on mute and let this great conversation begin. But thank you to all, all of my friends for joining us today. So today, I think we're going to start with a question uh, for uh, Dr. Rebecca Given, who is uh, joining us as sort of every time we do one of these panels, we'd like to have one academic who who has thought about and researched these issues on on a broader level to give us some context, right? And you literally wrote the book on the subject. And so I wanted to, I mean, right now, um, healthcare workers and healthcare are getting a lot of attention because of the pandemic. Um, but some of the issues that have been going on in that field, and, and particularly in that field as it relates to labor, have been longstanding. Um, that they're not, and the inequity to racial inequity in terms of service, right? And, and how people are treated, um, the availability that they have to quality healthcare is also longstanding. These are not new things. What is happening is that the pandemic is putting a spotlight on long, long-term problems. So can you talk a little bit um, with us about a little, I'm gonna ask you a two-part question. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and, yeah. and your role, like what, like what your position is and, and what you do? And then just a little bit about this moment and how it relates to the, the research you've done on the, field, on the field of healthcare and labor. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a faculty member in labor studies at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, which is um, one of the sibling programs uh, to the program you all have at the University of Illinois. And I um, teach classes on undergraduate and graduate level, also do labor education and also do research in healthcare and education. And my healthcare research has been, my, my book argued uh, or I think showed, I hope, what happens when you do or don't uh, listen to frontline workers when you're trying to change healthcare, especially healthcare delivery. So what happens when you try to impose changes from above uh, without listening to those who um, are actually you know, at the coal face or however you want to say it, versus what happens if you try to um, make improvements where you um, give voice to those who are actually do, doing the work, uh, whether it's the bedside or whatever healthcare context you're in, and the importance really, the peril of ignoring frontline workers and the importance of um, elevating that voice and making sure that any change you try to implement is um, is uh, rooted in, in the, in the needs of the workers, which are very much aligned with the needs of the patients, right? And so um, I think it's very common to, especially when we're always uh, seeking more profit and seeking cost cutting, to try to pit patients and patients and uh, and workers against each other, just as we see in education pitting uh, kids and teachers against each other. But if you actually talk to the people that are delivering the care or the receiving or are receiving the care, they just know that that's not true. So um, you kind of stole the metaphor that I've been using. I think we've all been using about shining a light. The pandemic didn't change anything uh, that was right or wrong with the US healthcare system. It just shone a light on um, many of the very, very long-standing problems. So to sort of highlight a few, one would be tremendous problems with funding. So if you're in a public safety net hospital versus one of these private hospitals that um, oftentimes are ostensibly nonprofits, but uh, the amount of money that they, uh, they call surplus instead of profit each year and the executive compensation and the advertising and branding budgets do not look like nonprofits and you see uh, how they're able to operate. And then you look at a safety net hospital where uh, there may be a high Medicaid or uninsured population, and you see that they're really, really struggling. They can't access PPE. Uh, they can't. Uh, they can't get the staffing level they need. So these disparities, which are layered, this is America, so they're layered right into racial disparities. They are one and the same. There's you cannot separate them. Those became uh, particularly visible. Um, another one I'd say is just the incentives that are built into the healthcare system. So our healthcare system 
uh, has many, many ways to make money. And to make money, you want to do high, high margin elective care, right? You want to do a lot of MRIs. You want to do, I mean, some stuff we call it elective, but we know from ourselves and our family members that it's still important. So a knee replacement or a hip replacement is still important. And I don't want to dismiss that. But those, um, those uh, types of procedures are highly profitable. That'll, that'll help you pay for your vacation home and your boat. Um, taking care of sick people who may not have uh, particularly comprehensive insurance is not highly profitable. Another thing that's not highly profitable is preparedness, right? So stockpiling the number of N95s that you will need if and when a pandemic comes is expensive. And you need to invest in that if you're going to be ready, but there's no profit to be made from being ready for a pandemic. You have to invest because you believe in population health, not because it's going to make you more money, right? And so the incentives are not there. The incentive is, don't have PPE ready, uh, cut back, uh, roll the dice, uh, and go make more money with elective procedures. So the incentives are all wrong for public health, population health, and preparedness. The other one that I won't say much about because um, our, our other uh, folks on the panel will no doubt drive this home is staffing, right? We've had this tremendous resistance from health insurers and hospital associations to actually having sufficient staffing. I mean, the evidence is, it's almost a joke how much evidence there is for the positive impact of having appropriate staffing levels for patients and for you know nurses and other healthcare staff in terms of burnout, on the job injuries, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, but there's been tremendous resistance to mandating appropriate staffing levels. And we saw the impact of that in the pandemic. Uh, we'll see if policymakers decide now to act on it. Um, and then the other one I'll just touch on is, is more general, but hits all these areas, which is the importance of employee voice, right? And so that's where you start to see the difference between a unionized workforce and a non-unionized workforce, where non-unionized workers uh, can often be very, very afraid to speak up when, um, when uh, infection control procedures are not being followed, when they don't have sufficient PPE, or just when, you know, there's a surge and the numbers are out of control and they'd like to tell somebody there's tremendous, tremendous fear. Um, and so we've seen the unionized workforce really um, having to speak for everyone and say, this is what everyone's experiencing, but I have the protection of being unionized, of having some due process rights. So I will speak up about this terrible situation, this uh, insufficient staffing level, this lack of PPE, uh, this situation that's putting patients and our whole communities at risk, because as a unionized you know, nurse, uh, assistant, environmental service worker, any of that, I have the ability to call this out and uh, others who are also experiencing the same thing don't have that protection and really can't comfortably speak up. So um, those are some of the areas I think that we've really seen um, become uh, just uh, glaring in the, in the current crisis. Wow, I, I feel like you've given us a roadmap, a framework uh, for our discussion and, and, and a lot of the issues, especially here in Champaign-Urbana, that issue about a quote unquote for-profit um, hospital that doesn't actually operate like that is a very pressing issue in our in our local community. Um, but I wanted to, to go with what you were talking about at the end about actually workers having a voice and how you sort of began your conversation about listening to workers. And we have on the call of, of somebody who's worked on the front line, right, for more than three decades. And so Doris, you know, you, we just heard uh, Rebecca say, we gotta listen to the people that are actually healthcare uh, practitioners. We gotta listen to the people that are on the front line. So as somebody who's on the front line, what are you saying right now? What are you seeing in terms of COVID and what needs to be happening um, for workers um, and, for, and for patients in the field of healthcare in this moment? Sure, thank you so much. And it really struck me when Dr. Given mentioned about the non-union workers who don't have a voice because we heard very much in the beginning of the pandemic that 
uh, facilities were firing physicians, were firing nurses here in Chicago. We heard about it in Northwestern. And so these people didn't have any protections. And of course, in Russia, they were throwing doctors out, out the windows, what I was hearing, you know, actually killing them for speaking up. So of course, you know, we have what we have here and what I've worked at University of Illinois, the Illinois Nurses Association has been at our hospital um, at um, for almost uh, for 46 years. And so we, our voice is powerful. We have actually, um, we've really become united these last three years. And then the pandemic just solidified it because our administrators were not listening to us. They weren't listening to the bedside nurses in the ICUs that first were seeing these patients and in the emergency room. Luckily, our union has representation on in both the ED and as the ICU. And what we found is what administration was trying to tell us to do, and they rolled out this type of nursing process of caring for our patients by forcing nurses in ICU to take care of up to four patients and therefore, and then have about five runners who were regular floor nurses or physical therapists, occupational therapists to in a sense help the ICU nurse. Well, the bedside nurses just revolted because we, they didn't talk to the bedside nurses about this. And it resulted, it, it went live for a couple of days and then it just went away because they still expected the nurses to do everything you were expected to do when you had one or two patients, but now you had four patients. So it really um, failed. And they told us that this is what they were doing in New York. Um, and if they were, you know, we certainly know patients were dying, just dying. And we, of course, had that here. And not until the INA went to the media did we also uh, get what we needed, which was the PPE. And um, I'm sorry, it wasn't the PPE, it was actually the hazard pay. We were um, just talking to uh, our nurse leaders. We started out talking to them every day, which was kind of amazing that they actually would listen to us, but we did. And then they started to push back and they didn't want to talk to us every day. So they had us talking to HR who were furiously writing down things that they had no clue about because they were not medical people. And, but we really pushed it home, but really not until March 27th, I believe it was when the INA went to the media that said 12 nurses were infected. And they then gave us, um, don't know, I am getting this all mixed up. Is they gave us the universal masking, which what we were asking for. And it wasn't and N95s, but it was surgical masks. Because at the time we had nurse leaders going across the hospital saying, Why are you wearing masks? You're gonna scare the patients. This is what they were telling our nurses. So the universal masking came out one week before the CDC and the World Health Organization actually recommended it across the country. We were the first hospital and that was because of the union, because of the INA. And we really appreciate our union. We, it galvanized us. And then instead of just having the usual nurse leaders through the last several months, in the last six months, We've had leaders across the hospital come out, across also at St. Joe's in Joliet, who um, really are making a difference in their daily lives in the hospital. Um, and, and just lastly, I wanna say about the hazard pay. Again, we had nurses. I remember I did an article for a neighborhood newspaper that I actually used to deliver when I was a kid. And uh, my friend, she she's one of the um, journalists there. and. I remember speaking to her a month into the uh, pandemic and I just, you know, we were, we were terrified. We really were. We didn't know a, a lot. We were getting most of our information from the news, very little from administration because they were scrambling too to try to get information. So we just said, hey, you need to look at this. You need to think about what does it take for a nurse to come to a hospital and care for a patient 
that they might get infected themselves and die as well. And nurses, all of our nurses were ready to do that. It, it, we, we know that. But what was disgusting was during negotiations, we had a nurse leader tell us that you signed up for this, that you signed up. And we're like, we didn't sign up to get killed, to be infected and then bring the infection home to our families and die. And, and that's indeed what happened. Two of our nurses died and one nurse became infected and brought it home to her family and her husband died. And we know the uh, other unions on campus, uh, administration was very hush hush about what they would report to us. We do know over six months, over 200 nurses became infected in our hospital. And we're still trying to find out what the current figure is. So you're right. The administration needs to talk to bedside people, people who know what we're doing, building service workers, clerical staff, nurse techs, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and they don't. And that's not unique to hospitals. We know that. And so I, I appreciate the forum to be here today to, to speak out to that concept, that issue, that you talk to the workers. We know what's going on at the front line. And Thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks. Alice, I want to follow up on that with you. Um, we, you know, we both of these speakers have talked about the importance of organized labor as it relates to um, protecting workers. And, you know, we a lot of times in the labor ed program here talk about what unions are about at the end of the day is basic dignity on the job and the idea that people should be able to go to work, make a decent wage to take care of their families and come home at the end of the day safely. And can you tell us a little bit about the Illinois Nurses Association, your organization, what it is for our listeners who aren't familiar, you know, who you represent and, and how the INA has been responding uh, to the pandemic and to this moment? Sure, Th thank you, Stephanie. So the Illinois Nurses Association, I'll, I'll start with, you know, describing a little bit about, um, about who we are. Um, it's been a really good discussion. I um, had a couple of things from the um, uh, Dr. Given and um, President Doris Carroll that I wanted to comment on um, as well. So the Illinois Nurses Association is an a, um, organization for nurses that was founded in um, 1901 at the World's Fair. Nurses across the state came together to standardize um, the practice of nursing and at the time, um, there was no standard for what was a nursing, uh, what was a nursing education, what were the proper credentials that a nurse needed to have. At that time, there was also no Nurse Practice Act, so there was no definition of um, what was a, a registered nurse. There was a lot of um, correspondence schools, uh, groups out there that were looking to make money off of um, people just to call themselves a nurse, but we're not, um, we're not actually a nurse. Uh, we're, we're not actually ha um, learning the real skills that they needed to properly care for a patient. And, you know, something to be aware of is at, at that time, so, um, you know, modern day uh, professional nursing was essentially created, um, you know, through the Civil War. It was, you know, a national crisis um, and, and um, tragedy that um, you know brought nurses to the, the forefront. They were really you know the heroes on the front lines, um, you know saving um, you know saving uh, soldiers and saving patients. And I think that um, you know, we can see that tradition kind of you know cycling itself um, over over the years. Um, just like at that time, you know nurses are are the heroes on the front line today. Um, so that's essentially how the organization was was founded. Um, we um, it, initially the focus was on um, the Nurse Practice Act and defining nursing. And over the years, as um, uh, um, collective bargaining became legal for um, both in the public sector and for uh, nonprofit healthcare, nurses in the state of Illinois began began organizing. And um, today we represent nurses in both the, the private and the public sector throughout the state of Illinois, everywhere from the most southern tip and in Illinois to um, the northern um, tip of, of the state. Um, so that's, that's kind of how, how the organization was founded and, and who we are. Um, how the INA has been responding to the, the pandemic, 
um, you know, it's hard to describe the level of overwhelm that was taking place when, um, like in, in mid-March, when the pandemic was really hitting, um, Governor J.B. Pritzker got on television and was saying, you know, we needed to start tele telecommuting from, um, you know, everyone needed to start telecommuting and not going into work, not going into the office. Um, so there was just this, um, you know, tremendous uh, crisis that, that was hitting. And um, it was, you know, very overwhelming, you know, for, for the nurses. But, you know, just like um, they have throughout history, you know, the nurses came together and said, okay, you know, these are the things that we need to do in order to respond to the current crisis. And one of the most important things that I think the INA did was something um, that, that Doris referenced a lot, which was um, through the media, getting, getting into the media and telling the truth. When you think back to that time, there was nobody actually telling the truth about what was happening during this pandemic other than frontline healthcare workers. There was many times where we saw, you know, public officials say things that just, you know, they just weren't true. Like, oh, the, the, the PPE crisis isn't, isn't that bad now. It, it, at times where it was, it was um, you know, really, really uh, terrible and needed to be fixed and, and needed to be addressed. Um, so the nurses getting on the media and saying, these are the real problems. This is what's actually going on was a huge service to, to the public um, at, at that time. Without that, we wouldn't have had anyone else, um, anyone else doing that. Um, we created, you know, we had to create a system um, for our members for real-time reporting where they were lacking um, personal protective equipment. It, it, I, you know, to give you an example, we would literally, you know, talk to a nurse. Um, the the uh, uh, PPE situation that they would have enough, they would, they, they thought they had the equipment that they need at the facility where they work at, but um, it turns out, you know, the next day they're being given, um, we have a facility where instead of being given actual um, proper medical gowns, they were being given, um, it was like rain ponchos for, for personal protective equipment. So things would change incredibly quickly. Um, we would think that nurses had the, ma the N95 masks that, that they needed. And then we would get information stating that the N95 masks that they had were actually um, from Home Depot. They, were, um, they weren't medical grade masks and they weren't going to properly protect the nurses. So the information was changing so quickly, we put a mechanism in place where nurses could report um, quickly and um, you know, give us the information we needed and what was going on with the uh, personal pr protective equipment. Um, because the equipment wasn't being provided um, by the employer, by the, the hospitals and the different healthcare facilities, um, the INA actually started coordinating, you know, donation efforts, and we got, you know, thousands of face shields and mask straps um, out to our members, you know, equipment that that they needed. That was um, something that was really important for us to to work on. Um, I think we were the first organization in the state of Illinois that came out and um, publicly demanded um, childcare for, for nurses and for healthcare workers as, you know, one of the things that, you know, we were, we were asking at the very beginning of the pandemic is, okay, there's, there's currently a nursing shortage. They don't have enough uh, nursing staff as it is. Nurses are going to start, uh, start getting, getting sick. Um, they're going to have to, you know, quarantine, and, and the, the nurses that are left on the front lines are gonna to have to work more and more hours. Who's going to help them with, with childcare? So that's something that we were out in front, um, in front fighting for. And we were um, also advocating for access to, um, access to testing. You know, at that, at, in March, I remember, you know, talking to nurses, um, you know, one of whom worked with, with veterans and she had symptoms indicating she might have um, COVID and it was like this desperate struggle to try to get, you know, access to, to testing for her, which was, you know, obviously not just important for the nurses, but important for the patients and, and the residents that they're taking, they're taking care of. So fighting for the access to testing was something that, that, um, that we were working on um, as well. And, um, you know, as, as Doris referenced er earlier, um, the hazard pay was something that we fought for 
at, at, at um, you know, all of our facilities. We were able to get it at, at some hospitals, um, not, not all of them, unfortunately, but I believe that the U University of Illinois was the first hospital in the na nation to give hazard pay to their nurses, which is, is fair. It's additional pay for the additional risk that they were um, taking on for themselves and their families um, on the job. Um, you know, one other thing I, I did want to mention, um, I, we, uh, we also held um, some um, online um, counseling support classes for our members. Uh, they, they were they were not well attended, but we we wanted to offer that that service because our members have went through losing their colleagues, um, losing their their family members, and just a constant worry about you know the risk to to their own health. And you know I, I'm of the opinion that the um, the mental health aspect of this entire pandemic on healthcare workers we don't know the full extent of it yet. But that's going to have a huge impact, um, and that's something that the INA cares a lot about, giving support to our members in any way that we can. I think that, um, and I, thank you so much, Alice. I think what all three of you, Alice Doris and Rebecca, have put forward as one of the major themes for this discussion already is that the workers are the ones who need to be listening or need to be listened to in terms of how to actually effectively deal with the problems that we face, the crises that we're in right now. Um, and, and Doris brought it out beautifully that that's a historical issue. It's not something that is only happening in one sector of labor. This is something that we've always had to face. And it comes down to an, an, an honest and uh, a discussion about power and ideology in that the employers do not have the respect to just outright listen to the rank and file workers, even though they're the ones that have the experiences. And I think that's something that we oftentimes forget to put out there is that there is an ideological issue at the heart of the struggle that nurses and other rank and file workers have to deal with by just getting the employers to just listen to their experiences and their actions and that's why there's so much of this and why you know, the INA just had this wonderful strike and this wonderful victory came from those particular ideological conflicts and so I think that that's one of the biggest things we want listeners to take away from this forum first of all is that the workers must have the voice their voices centralized into how we deal with any problem that they are facing. If you haven't done the position, if you're not doing the work, you're not actually there giving the advice or working with the people, then you have to listen to those on the front lines. And I think that that's why the front line aspect or the metaphor is so important here. And so I kind of want to take it back to, or, or excuse me, grow it outward. Let's go macro a bit. And I want to talk to Dr. Given here, but Doris and Alice, you can comment as well. But Dr. Given, we talked a lot about what's happening currently in the United States. And your work deals a lot with what happens outside the United States as well. So in relation to this crisis, how are the workers responding in other spaces outside the United States that you've been tracking? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, I would say, the whole spectrum from countries that uh, similarly were underprepared for a pandemic and also do not uh, properly listen to the voices of frontline workers and face, you know, similar crises. Um, we've got a global epidemic of healthcare worker deaths, including. Um, RN deaths, um, and you see it as as we've said, you know that disparate impact on different communities. So, um, you know, the Philippines has been a, a supplier or a sending countries for healthcare workers, especially nurses, all over all over the world. And the Filipino uh, healthcare worker community has been really devastated by uh, the crisis. The number of deaths in the U.S. one in three uh, RNs. We think the numbers are terrible because the government doesn't require any good any good data collection but about one in three nurses that have died of covid we think in the in this pandemic have been have been filipino nurses in the us um so we see you know the crisis hitting everywhere and then we also see you know some countries um 
just have systems in place that are better prepared to deal with something like this. So if you have um, a healthcare system where people aren't afraid to get healthcare because they're afraid of the cost, um, they will uh, be more proactive in uh, seeking care when they need it. Or if you have a place like Korea, which had recently dealt with a pandemic and so understood all kinds of measures from tracking and tracing to masking, um, to uh, get a pandemic under control, that helps everybody, including healthcare workers. So I would say we see um, we see sort of the whole range, and what we see everywhere is the workers that were you know ignored and mistreated and underpaid and disrespected uh, before the pandemic, especially the healthcare workers are the ones that then suffered the greatest impact during the pandemic. And we see that um, all over the world. Thank you, Dr. Given. And I think that kind of ties into where we're going next with this is the issue of the resistance and the striking. Because, you know, I, I think that this is, this is something that we, when we follow in history, we've noticed that during the periods of crises like this, especially in terms of worker safety, and the precariousness of employment, you have higher incidences of labor militancy, you have more strikes, you have deeper organizing. Uh, uh, Post-World War II, 1945, 1946, whenever there were panics, 1870 through 1893, and then when you look at 2008, 2009, you saw some of the most, some of the most intense organizing happening worldwide, right? And so, and this question is for all three of you, depending on whoever wants to whoever wants to answer. But in terms of the elements of, of of strikes, how are you how are you seeing other workers respond? Healthcare workers respond across the country, across the world, in terms of labor militancy, because that's a question that's really coming up a lot now, especially when the issue came up that well. You know, I, I forgot, I think it was Dr. Fossey who made the ridiculous comment that teachers and healthcare workers are going to be our guinea pigs for when the, the, the country reopened back in June and July. I mean, it was just an outright disgusting comment to make. But in the essence, many workers, many healthcare workers had to make a decision of whether to quit and worry about not having the ability to, to provide for their families in need or they would have to risk their lives and, and deal with these unsafe working conditions that have already, that were already bad, but now they've been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so many organizations and unions, both non-union and, and union felt backed into striking, having to do the, the unthinkable. You know, the one thing that you never want to do unless you have to do it is go on strike. And so what are you, what, what are you, what are y'all's thoughts about that type of re, that, that type of response and how it has been developing over time, especially as the US in particular has taken this position of we're not gonna stop the virus or protect people anymore. We're gonna wait on a vaccine to save us whenever it comes. Like, how do you feel about that, that, that dichotomy currently occurring right now? I'll say, I'll say briefly, and then I would love to hear about the experience of the strike in Illinois, but to me, it makes a lot of sense, right? Striking is a last resort. It's scary. You're not going to get paid. You may uh, lose uh, friendships and family relationships. You're, you know, you may struggle financially if it's a protected strike. But if you just told someone they should die for their job or they should infect their family members who should be willing to die, then striking is actually not as extreme as telling someone they ought to be okay with dying on the job. So you just really changed that calculation. And I think that's why we saw an upsurge in willingness to strike because you just told, you know, hundreds of thousands of workers that who did not sign up for this, that they should be willing to die. And, you know, they are, go they are going to stand up for themselves and their families and their patients. Yeah, I, I like to comment, you know, in the middle, uh, early in the pandemic, there was several uh, nurses online that were having that conversation that this is going to be the time that we are going to unite. This is for nurses, the year of the nurse 2020, we are not going to stand for a chronic short staffing anymore. And then they went silent. <laughs> Online they did, they just, and a lot of them, the people I were talking to were, were non-union nurses, but there was a nurse 
who was doing this national, um, she wanted to do a class action lawsuit against the administration because of the lack of PPE and also not just administration, but also hospital associations. How dare they treat us healthcare workers like this? And the response was very small. And it was shocking to me because all these years I tried, we, I listened to nurses and we, we complain, but to try to mobilize them and organize has always been difficult because we have that, that patriarchal healthcare system that tells us you're, you're just so good. You, you really take care of those patients. And, and what will we do if you don't, if you're not here, if you go on strike, what will the patients do? And so <laughs> you're right. We had that unfortunate perfect storm at least happen here in Illinois where we have organized nurses. And we were at, at a point where you're asking us to jeopardize our lives, our families' lives, and what? You don't want to give us enough PPE? and you're not gonna staff a state as safely. And so, yeah, we were ready to go on strike. And, and we had that count, a historic strike authorization count at University of Illinois. We have, a, the number fluctuates 13 to 1400 nurses, but we had nine, 995 nurses authorized a strike against 12. I think that was pretty much unanimous. Um, and what also people need to remember is, you know, yes, the staffing shortage was was bad before, and it was, of course, accelerated during the pandemic. And we have that research that Dr. Given mentioned earlier, over two decades of research. And Professor Linda Aiken actually is one of the gurus of, of nursing research for staffing, safe staffing. And she did a survey pre-COVID of Illinois nurses and New York nurses, because we are hopefully on the precipice of passing staffing legislation. And she, uh, the, the pandemic of course delayed the publication, but on August 18th, we announced it during a press conference, the INA uh, and our leaders at U of I and how, how chronically staffed our hospitals in Illinois and New York were pre pandemic. And now we're waiting uh, for her to publish another study just looking at Illinois nurses. So we're hoping to hear that any day. And we're hoping to use that uh, uh, research again to ramp up for our um, legislation on safe patient limits and reintroduce, reintroduce it again in the spring. Um, staffing is bad. Nurses will tell you that. Nurses are the number one most trusted profession by the public per Gallup poll year after year for 18 years. The public understands we, where we're coming from. Why doesn't hospital administration wanna to listen to us and work with us? But we do know why. It's historic. It's been uh, going on for a long time. And we are just, you know that, we don't get paid for our services like physicians or therapists do. We are on that line item budget that says room charge. That's where our services are, in the room charge. And I think this is the year that nurses need to stand up. And we did at St. Joe's and at University of Illinois. And I hope to see other nurses across the country do the same thing. Thanks. Yeah. I, I can only speak for the militancy and um, you know, of, 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 our, of our members and what happened. Um, in, in this this past year, um, you know, we had the strike at um, at U of I, and also strike in uh, Muta St. Joseph in in Joliet, and I I think that um, you know the the impetus behind all of that was nurses were essentially abandoned um, by hospital leadership at the moment they needed those they needed that leadership the most to protect them to provide a safe workplace. It was, um, you know, the, the deepest betrayal that you can imagine what, what happened. You know, uh, something we've heard over and over again from nurses is that they would see, you know, before the pandemic, you know, hospital, um, you know, administration would do these awkward things like, um, you know, try to hand out 
you know, cookies and, and have these um, chats and, and things with the nurses, you know, different methods of, you know, trying to, to, to connect with, with the, um, with the uh, frontline uh, nurses, which, you know, were, were not that effective, but they at least existed. And then when the, the pandemic hit full force, those same administrators were nowhere to be found. They were just gone. And that's something that we've heard over and over from, from the nurses that they're, they're on, on, they were in the hospital or, or, or they're at their clinic every day, you know, taking these risks, you know, maybe they had the equipment they needed that day, maybe they didn't, but all of the um, administrators were, you know, most of them were working from home, you know, they were, they were telecommuting. And I think that most nurses saw that as, um, you know, an abandon, an abandonment. And I don't think that any nurses are going to ever forget that. So when they were abandoned by the administration, whose very job it was to protect them, nurses turned to each other because they saw that 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 was, you know, um, that was what they had left. It was, you know, we, we're in this together. We have to fight this for together. No one else is going to do this for us. Right. We, I just re recently heard of the story in the ICU where when they had patient zero from who had COVID and they actu actually had to Google online how to care for that patient and what Italy was doing for those patients because the leadership wasn't there to help them. So those very same nurses are the most militant now in our organization at University of Illinois because they understand what a union can do for them. And they were out on that strike line, that picket line every day, every day. And the first day it was pouring rain and we were, that didn't stop us, that nurses were there, they brought their families, they brought their dogs, they brought everybody. And we had much, much um, support from the other unions uh, across the Chicagoland area, uh, AFL, CIO, Chicago Federation of Labor, SCIU, of course, oh my God, when they arrived, it was like a party, but it was, it was just so important for nurses to see that, yeah, this is, this is what we're trying to do, to have a, a hospital that's safe for us and safe for our patients please do that for us. And that's what we wanted. And they didn't provide that for us. And I just, I just want to add that the, the we'll see, uh, we talked about the long-term impact of the pandemic is very much unknown. The long-term impact of going on strike also remains to be seen. Strikes change you and strikes are contagious. So those workers themselves that went on strike their bond with their coworkers and their union is unbreakably strong now. And they, their families and their communities have all experienced that solidarity, that power and the victory that came with it. And now they in turn, whether they work in healthcare or something else, are more likely to realize that strikes work. And in Chicago, you have that growing situation because anyone with a, with a teacher in their family, there's tens of thousands of teachers who have the, the recent experience of being on strike and the hard part and what it takes and how much you have to build to it and then how it feels and, and how it can succeed. And so that energy will carry on and make people more willing to go on strike in the future when they see that in some situations that's going to be the only way to get what they need and to get their demands met. So this is something that, that will grow and strikes feed each other into more strikes. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And, and that is definitely something that we've seen over the last, you know, since 2012 with the first Chicago teacher strike going through 2017, 2018. Um, you know, we had one here on campus with the graduate student workers that this that this sense of how things were going in public education was not OK, that labor had something to say about that. And and it and those that wave of strikes had had to do with the workplace, but also had to do with things like equity in education, access to, to quality education. And I feel like the same kind of conversation right now is happening in healthcare. Yes, it's about the workers, but it's also about what do we expect from our healthcare system? What does equity in healthcare look like? And so this is a question for all three of the panelists. But before I ask it, I want to mention to those folks who are watching on Facebook Live, if you have a question, you could type it into the comments and we will get your question answered because we don't want to. Um, 
monopolize all the question time. So if you have a question um, that you'd really like answered from these three amazing panelists, please type it in and Gus and I will, will uh, get that question asked. But th since I have the mic right now, the question I want to ask all of you is what's next, right? If, if the spotlight has been shown that inequity um, and how people are treated um, both as, you know, as workers is not okay, right? And that we aren't, we haven't been listening um, and that the crisis um, is deeper because we weren't prepared, because we weren't listening to the frontline healthcare workers. Well, now it, I feel like everybody's, I mean, one of the reasons we're spotlighting this issue is because it's on everybody's mind, right? It's it's a national conversation. Um, Bob Ryder, the, the president of the Chicago Federation of Labor wrote a really powerful op-ed that came out a few months ago during the crisis. And he said, you know, basically, how this is going to be judged is what do we do next? Like, are we going to come out of this stronger? Are we going to be, are we going to build a more equitable labor movement? Are we going to build safer and stronger workplaces? Right? So for all three of you, what's next in the terms, what do you, what would you like to see next in the terms of labor and healthcare um, in this country? <laughs> and anyone, I know it's a big question. So any one of you can answer that first. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think we see the importance for everyone of uh, organized protected voice. And so I think we will see and I hope we will see more organizing in healthcare. We need um, more unionized healthcare workers so that they can speak up, speak out for their patients as well as themselves and their communities. Um, and I do think um, that uh, healthcare workers realize the difference and it's very, very hard to organize in this country. The odds as, um, you know, you all know, certainly the panelists don't need me to tell them the odds are really, really stacked against the workers, but, um, it's needed now more than ever. And, um, so I think we, we may see more of that. And I think we'll also see an examination of the healthcare system and how you access the healthcare system, because we have um, so many millions of people losing their jobs and losing access to their employer sponsored health healthcare and not to get too much into the weeds of all, all the policy stuff, but you know, people who live in states that didn't do Medicaid expansion um, are left out, out in the cold, right, right now. And so realizing that, um, whatever you think the change should be to in terms of, you know, is it Medicare for all? Is it, you know, different public options? Is it, you know, more of an employer and individual mandate? We, you can get into it and I love to do it in terms of what there should be. What we know is right now there are too many gaps. There's medical bankruptcy is an ep epidemic. People not seeking care because they can't afford it because they're underinsured is a huge problem. So changing access and making it more equitable through one route or other, I think has to happen. We To have people without access to care during a pandemic is just unconscionable. Uh, I'd, I'd like to echo that the, the access to care, the pandemic really pointed it out to us that here in Chicago, at least, um, who the patients were that were becoming infected. And in Chicago, 13% of our population are African-American people, but yet up to 40, 60% actually were the ones uh, in the early uh, months that became infected. I don't know what the current statistics are, but, um, and so, and then as you pointed out as well, um, one in three uh, Filipino nurses died due, due, due to COVID. So we have to protect the workers, we have to protect the patients, but what's going on in the communities that are, that are allowing this to happen? We know now there's a hospital closing on the South Side, that's a, um, Mercy Medical. Uh, where will those patients go? They attempted to close down Provident ED in the, in the middle of the pandemic, what did that say to our patients? And also even before the pandemic, 
the uh, incredible inequity for African-American pregnant women. I'm an old labor and delivery nurse. And so this was so shocking for me to hear that in 2019, many studies were starting to show that even though we are the you know, wealthiest countries in the world here in the US, um, the statistic, oh, I just went out of my mind. There, at least for African-American women, there were 40 women dying per 100,000 patients as opposed to 13 who are white. I mean, and it and people might try to say, well, it's your personal choices. No, it's not. It's lack of access to health care and the inequities that go on on in certain parts of our city, the not being able to have clean air and water and what our administration has done to that. So um, how the labor movement will change that is um, it's a good question. And I, I really hope that, you know, we have a union that's made, that's it's fairly diverse, but we as a union have to, to I think, look at that question and, and see what we're going to do and, and how we can help our communities, our patients, and of course the nurses that we serve as being in the union as members. Yeah, I think, um... Yeah, it's two, it's two really big, big questions. Um, you know, Doris mentioned, uh, you know, Provident Hospital and Provident Hospital was founded because at that time, uh, there was an African American nurse that wanted to go to nursing school and none, no other nursing school in Chicago would would admit her. So um, uh, Provident Hospital was um, was founded both through um, leadership in the African American community and um, at, at the time it was actually the, the captains of, of uh, business that also donated because um, they needed a, a place to provide um, health care for, for their workers. So it was um, you know, George Pul Pullman and McCormick, um, I think Marshall Fields, you know, some of these um, uh, you know, different, different industries donated to, to that as well. So we have to consider the, um, you know, the racism within um, healthcare it, itself, um, not just within the patients, but within in the workforce is a, a huge problem that has to be has to be addressed. Um, we have you know very diverse membership, and we recently um, created uh, committees for you know people of color so that they can be um, um, empowered and have a voice to um, you know, addre address these, these issues. But it's, it's something um, that um, is, you know, continues to be a, a huge problem today. Well, and I'm, I'm really, I mean, it's, it's broadening it out our conversation, but I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Mercy Hospital issue. Um, you know, Mercy Hospital um, and annually, uh, it sees more than 40,000 emergency room visits. It's the third hospital in the last few years that serve predominantly black neighborhoods to close, uh, to or to uh, you know go through the process of closing in Chicago. The next um, closest hospital for folks that live in, near Mercy is three miles away, um, and so and and this is not unique, right, to Chicago. This is um, the even access to healthcare is is shrinking at a time when it kind of boggles the mind that that, that would be happening and, and how organized later labor um, deals with that, deals with this moment um, while also trying to, you know, battle for basic workplace protections on the job is, it, there's a lot, right? There, there's a lot. And, and, and as, as Dr. Given said, the conversation about how, how we access healthcare and how we, how, how, that works and in many cases doesn't work, right? For, for people um, is, is a conversation that we need to continue to have. Um, the, the last question that I have and that we got is, what can regular people do to support workers, frontline healthcare workers? Like what, if, if you're not a frontline healthcare worker, but you care about this issue, right? And you care about um, nurses, um, or other healthcare workers on the front line. What should we be doing right now in this moment? If, if, if there's any, if there's anything that we could be doing to support uh, frontline workers, um, what can we be doing in this moment? I'd just like to say, in in Illinois, uh, please start talking to your legislators. Uh, 
your uh, representatives and senators because we want to pass that safe patient limits legislation. It's it's just so basic. It may not it may not safe patient limits alone may not be an easily understandable phrase, but that what that really means is making sure that a nurse does not have too many patients to care for because the research shows if if a nurse has too many patients, a lot of things get missed. You, you don't get your pain medications, patients fall and endure more injury. Um, <clears throat> patients have more infections, patients die in a hospital because there's just not enough nurses. And so we know that hospitals want just a skeletal staff plan in place. They now call, they now call it just-in-time staffing. Over the 37 years I've been a nurse, it's just, they change it all the time. But this just-in-time staffing is just not enough. And what we need to uh, just have regular people is pick up the phone, call your legislators, and ask them, I want to be taken care of in a hospital. I, I need you to pass this legislation. And it's really a no-brainer, but it really, we have to fight the hospital association to make this happen. And because they are the ones that will spend the money. In Massachusetts, they spent $25 million to stop and defeat the ballot uh, question in November of 2018. And they defeated it 70 to 30%. So, you know, can that happen again here in Illinois? Of course it can, but I really think we need to educate everybody. So that's one thing. I'm sure everyone else has other questions or has other points to make. Um, I would, you know, what um, this, the supporting the safe staffing is extremely important. Um, in addition to supporting the legislation, you know, talk to your, your local legislators, ask them their position on, on the bill, ask them to support the legislation. If you're, if you're going to, if, if you're admitted to the hospital or your loved one is admitted, ask the question, ask, you know, how many patients are assigned to the registered nurse that's, you know, taking care of, of my, my loved one, you know, be, um, be assertive, be curious, ask questions about that. It's, you know, it's not, it's not just about the nurse, it's about the care that your loved one is, is receiving. And, you know, there's so many, um, you know, there's, there's so many problems that, that were exposed and, and came out. Um, you know, there was a reporter that did a piece a while back on how difficult it was just to find out how many registered nurses in the state of Illinois, how many healthcare workers have, have died as a result of, of the COVID pandemic, how many have contracted them on the job. Why is this information that is so difficult to get? It's difficult to get because of where our, our priorities are and the resources aren't put into, you know, those types of things. So I think, um, you know, demanding the staffing, um, you know, demanding access to care, demanding that there be, you know, transparency and, and health care and, you know, things like, you know, what's happening to our health care workers is, is should not be a mystery. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, I think, you know, I think those things are really important. And I think um, approaching these challenges with a spirit of empathy, which to me means listening to the workers. So whether you're talking about uh, where you or a loved one is receiving health care, where whether in a hospital or another setting, understanding, I mean, one is just showing appreciation to the workers in a, in a human to human way, but the other is understanding what challenges they're going through. If you feel the care you or your loved one is getting isn't, isn't what you'd like it to be, is it because of lack of funding, lack of staffing, um, you know, too many on the job injuries, so they're shorthanded, whatever it is. So approaching it from a spirit of empathy, and for me that goes to policy debates and voting as well. There's so much money um, in the mix, especially in healthcare, where the lobbying and the campaigning, uh, the example from Massachusetts is a big one. When there's a debate about a healthcare policy uh, going on, what do the healthcare workers think about it? What do the nurses think about that? Make sure that you get information from those that really live it every day and that know it best. And you don't take it from some of those that uh, have other incentives and other interests in certain policy outcomes. Um, and so to me, that sort of spirit of empathy and spirit of um, prioritizing the voice of those who, who live it every day and who do this work and for, and, you know, for, for whom it is their lives, um, I think is extremely important, whether we're talking about, again, just um, in the human interaction when you're receiving health care, whether we're talking about how you're going to vote, how you're going to talk about policy change. 
Thank you so much. And I, I'm going to actually add, I know I asked the question, but I'm going to add a couple of things in. Um, one of my very favorite labor quotes, and Gus will laugh because I say this all the time, is that um, in during a minor strike, reportedly Mother Jones, who's one of my labor heroes, said, um, sit down and read, uh, prepare yourself for the coming conflict. And I like, I, whenever we have a forum like this, I, I like to point people out. To, in directions where they could get more knowledge and if they want to dive into things deeper. And I just honestly, Dr. Givens, your book, I think, lays out a lot of these debates. I mean, it was written before the pandemic, but a lot of the stuff you talk about are the issue, the very kind of issues and the very kind of conversations that, that we're having. And so the book is uh, the challenge to change reforming healthcare on the front line in the United States and the United Kingdom. So if you're looking for a place to start reading, uh, the second thing is show up, right? Is when, and, and this is, I think, one of the things that was so powerful about the Chicago teacher strike. Uh, you know, I, I'm down here in Champaign, but I was follow, or I'm sorry, the Chicago nurses strike. I was following the strike on Facebook. And how I was following it was not just on Doris's, you know, Facebook or on, you know, different nurses that I know up there, Facebook. It was also on Facebook of folks that are involved in organized labor from all sorts of different unions, from teachers to postal workers, right? People showed up, not just the nurses, not just the custodial workers that were also on strike at the same time, but just also, um, um, the, the just the the idea that that we need to show up for each other and whether it's picking up the phone and calling a legislator talking to a nurse you know about policy issues or if there's another strike showing up on you know showing up for them um and and, and being there so that we could all build uh we when we came up with the uh title for this um for this uh for this program um Bob, Dr. Bob Bruno came up with the title and just the idea of, and, and I think it's a very powerful idea of healing the nation, right? And, and healing, healing the nation, healthcare workers on the front line. But um, there's a lot of ways, just frankly, that our nation needs to heal from, from racial inequity to the fact that working people by and large are having a harder and harder time making it right, on a day-to-day -day, and having to make hard decisions between their health care and, and other needs. Um, and organized labor has, has a role to play in that conversation. And, and I really, I, I feel like we touched on a lot of topics and we probably could keep going for, for a while, but I want to respect people's time on this Sunday. Um, Gus, I don't know if you ha have any last words. I really don't. Um, I, think, I think you summed it up best, Stephanie, and I, I think that this is well, everything that the panelists have shared with us, with their experiences, with their analysis, everything we, we have to be able to communicate in so many ways to multiple groups. This is not where this conversation starts or needs to stop. Like we have to be very adamant that these, this is the information that has to get out. We have to centralize it into the narrative so that people consciousness will continue to raise so that we can be like these nurses who have gone through this major life-changing event of withholding their labor we have to be able to understand where they got to that point and we have to make sure that the people in the world know that this this crisis is not going to go away anytime soon that we have to start centralizing the voice of the workers who are on the front lines if we're ever going to actually lead to genuine change and i think that this is we have to have more of these types of forums we have to have more awesome activists and organizers like Allison Doris. We have to have more scholars like Rebecca's awesome work going out there. And we need to be promoting these things. And I just think that this is one of the vehicles of doing that. This is the type of media that makes a big difference. And so I'm just so appreciative of you all coming here today and being a part of this wonderful event. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we will be back in another month with another topic and, but thank you so much for the conversation and, and have a good rest of your, rest of your Sunday. Thank you. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.